Another thing that the guys tend to harp on about is the sensitization of the actual welds. And I got a letter the other day from, from a guy that read one of my articles, and he says, Ah, oh, Luca never, never mentions sensitizations of the weld. What happens when you use the wrong filler rod for your welds? Your, your welds will be sensitized. Well, duh. All right, so finally, let's get to welding this boiler and putting it together. So, a couple of tricks with welding. A boiler like this, because it's stainless steel and it's going to move around so much and distort and contract, you do need to tack everything together. The inner part of this boiler, so the firebox and the tubes and all of that, needs to be pre-welded. So that gets fully welded together before it goes into the outer shell. And the process for that is really, really simple. I make a jig to weld the tubes into the firebox backplate. And then each tube gets inserted and welded um, like I showed before. And I'll show you that type of welding right at the end when we, when we, weld, when we weld the smoke box tube plate to the tubes. That welding gets done, completed, everything, the, the smoke box, ah, the firebox wrapper goes on, the firebox back plate, the tubes, everything gets assembled. The crown stay gets assembled to the, the inner assembly and then that whole system gets seam welded together. That needs to be finished before it goes, goes into the outer shell and then the outer shell gets tacked and welded together like I have over here. A couple of points on the tack, tack welding before I get into the final welding. You'll notice that most of the tack welding is about 10 millimeters long. That is a little bit more than what you would normally do. Typically you would do about 5 millimeter tack weld. But in a boiler like this it's going to distort quite a bit. 10 mils seems to work a little bit better. And then the spacing is between 30 and 40. When you tack welding something like this, here's a couple of tricks. So if you weld the steam dome, um, in this case, in this, in this boiler, it's towards the end, closer to the firebox. You measure the one point. So let's say I choose this point. And in this case, it's 55 millimeters from the top of the shell. I tack it on at 55. But I don't worry about the position. I just tack one point with a given distance. Then what I do is that tack is fixed. I tap this so that it's perpendicular to the shell in this plane only. And once that is perpendicular to the plane on both sides to the outer shell, then I tack the other side. So now this is fixed in this direction. Then what I do is I tack another point once I've lined it up in that direction. So now it is fixed in this direction and then I just tack another point there. So now it is completely fixed like this and it is fixed like this. And that applies to everything on this boiler. So when I design my boilers, the outer shell goes into the um, back plate over here. And then again, I tack one point, I measure it up and I move it. I tack another point so that it's fixed in one plane. And then I measure the other side and I tack it and I tack it and it's completely fixed. When you're doing a run like that, I fix one point, I get the, the offset right and I tack it. And then I start on one side and I move clamping, clamping, clamping and I tack all the points down on one side and then I flip it around and invariably what happens is this plate would have pulled like this. And then you clamp it you pull it right and you tack it again from one side to the other. I always fix a curve and then I move towards a free end so that you can still move it. And that apply, that's the basic principle for tacking this whole bo boiler together. And once everything is tacked together, then finally we can get to, to the proper welding. And there are only real, there's only really two main types of welding on this boiler. So let me show you an example. Let me give you the quick rundown of the tacking. So this is what the tacking looks, looks like in, in 10 seconds flat. And this is an exploded view of finishing up the boiler. So as I mentioned previously, there are two fundamental types of weld in my boilers. And the first one is a fusion type weld. 
So there's no filler rod, it is just the tech torch and basically what you're doing is you are collapsing part of your weld joint and you're fusing it to another part of the weld joint. Now to get this right you need enough material, so typically whatever you're welding the inner part needs to stick out further, th further than um, the sort of weld material that you need and then your weld torch is woven from one side to the other. Basically what happens is you create a weld tool with sort of extruded material and then the, the puddle or the weld uh, puddle that you make collapses in the direction of the torch. So it actually follows the heat path. This type of welding is incredibly neat, but it has its limitations. The weld needs to be incredibly clean. So you cannot have any sort of suds or any pollutant in your weld area. Your gas setting needs to be slightly higher because now you, there's a much larger chance of oxidizing your weld. But at the end of the day, the welds are incredibly neat and they look very, very good. The other type of welding is the standard filler type welding where you hold your torch at say 40 degrees and your filler rod at 15 degrees and you just dip your, weld, your, dip your filler rod into your weld pool and the torch just follows suit. This is a standard TIG welding process and there are lots of examples on the internet to do this. And most of my welds on my boiler where this is applied is where there's a dis, uh, dissimilar size of uh, plate that gets welded together. So doing the seam welds on a boiler like this is actually the most terrific thing to do because you weld there and the whole thing distorts to this side. You weld this side and the whole thing distorts to that side and it just becomes a mess. If you balance the welds or the heat input into the material, you actually don't get that much distortion. So that age old story about, oh, stainless steel distorts and your boiler will look like all messed up. No, it won't. It's absolute rot. What you need to do is you need to balance your input, balance your welds, and when you weld a boiler like this, everything will stay where it should. Let me show you how to do that. If you weld something like this, which is a steam dome, for me, this plane is the most important plane. Now remember we tacked it in four places, so it is relatively rigid. But when you do a weld, it is going to pull to that side. So obviously if you do a weld there and you do a weld there, the whole thing's going to pull to that side, but it's going to pull faster than what you can correct it on the other side. So the idea is, if you have a seam run like this, I divide it into four, so it'll be one, two, three, four, and I typically weld it from there to there and there to there. So then that weld is balanced. And because I welded on this side a short run, it's moved a little bit while well, on this run, it's moved back. Then I weld it from there and then there again the welds are balanced. And I do that for all the circular things. So I do a quarter run, quarter run, quarter run, quarter run. Then that weld is perfectly balanced. For these odd welds that are quite long and around the circumference, what I typically do is I divide the weld into a number of runs. So it'll be one weld run there, one weld run there, one weld run there, and then I just connect the dots. So then I would weld, 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 and weld. Again, perfectly balanced. So as you can see, this boiler hasn't moved. It is still exactly where I had it before. And that same principle applies to all of the welds, just dividing it up. Then, of course, you divide these welds up as well. And exactly the same for the foundation ring. With a seam weld run at the bottom, I again do a weld run, a weld run, and then I fill in the dots. I try to limit the heat put at the end of a plate because that's typically where you get weld collapse. And one of the most important things is the tubes to balance your welds with the tubes. And there, there's a little bit more to that because you need to balance the heat on the most sensitive part of your weld. So on the firebox, on the inbox, on the inside, the, the, the tube plate on the firebox,
you need to weld the outside first because then you won't get the edge of your plate collapsing and then you alternate from one side to the other side in a cross hatch pattern as you go until everything is welded up. Now this boiler isn't finished. I still need to weld in the plugs for the bushes. I need to add two more bushes there. But this gives you a very good idea of how easy it is to weld the stainless steel boiler. So some of the things that, that the sort of armchair engineers or the gotcha engineers like to try and catch people out with whenever they want to have a look at a stainless steel boiler is typically the SCC, which is stress corrosion cracking, and that I dealt with in the first and second video. Uh, crevice corrosion cracking is the same as stress corrosion cracking, except you don't have your sensitization agent, which is your chlorides. Another thing that the guys tend to hop on about is the sensitization of the actual welds. And I got a letter the other day from, from a guy that read one of my articles and he says, Oh, Luca never, never mentions sensitizations of the weld. What happens when you use the wrong filler rod for your welds? Your, your welds will be sensitized. Well, duh, of course it's going to be sensitized if you use the wrong filler rod. So don't use the right filler rod. The other issues CCC and SCC I've dealt with, and typically you, you have to deal with that in the design phase of these boilers. There's not much you can do in the running side other than putting your um, boiler water through a little bit of carbon, which I did do. And I have mentioned that in my Ballarat series where I designed a filter for the Ballarat just to pump the water through a carbon filter to get the chlorides out. But you know what, to be honest, the, the surface potential stresses for these boilers I've designed well below the limit so they are good to go with uh, stress, cons well, stress corrosion cracking and so forth. That's it guys, That's, that finishes off the boiler series. I hope you enjoyed it, something a little bit different. I do my boilers very different to the, the normal way of doing model engineering boilers and to be honest I hope it catches on. These boilers cost between 20 and 30 percent of what a, you know, a, a copper boiler costs. So they're much, much cheaper. They're much easier to make. You don't need to worry about burning yourself when you have to heat up the whole copper component to silver solder it and so forth. So I really do hope that these stainless steel boilers take on specifically for the smaller boilers. Obviously, if you get to parts, say 10 or 15 liter boilers, which is the bigger locos, then I would definitely recommend steel. And then it's boilerplate. I wouldn't use stainless steel for the bigger boilers. But for these smaller boilers, I think this is the future for model engineering. Thanks for watching, guys.